This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to the JDC West uh, 2020 Finance Case Competition sponsored by RBC. Thank you to our judges, Tay Kim, Randy Bow, and Tracy Court, Nicole Drysdale. Competitors will have a maximum of 20 minutes to present. Immediately following the presentation, judges will have a total of five minutes to ask the presenters questions. Competitors, you will see Zoom chat notifications at various intervals to indicate the remaining time. Any speaker who continues to speak after the maximum time limit will be stopped. No questions or comments will be permitted from the audience. All judges are asked to have their microphones muted during the presentation. The audience is banned from any material or naming convection that bears the name or symbol of a competing university. We ask that the audience leave the Zoom call immediately following the presentation. Judges, please stay on this call until I advise you to move on to, ne to the next call. Competitors, you may begin your presentation. Not just take a bigger piece of the pie, but make the pie bigger. Mr. Kubisek, this is the philosophy that has awarded your company the strong brand reputation that it has today. So it's important that any recommendation going forward keeps in line with these ethics. My name is Raf, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Nicole and Gurkamal. Together, we're energy consulting. Before we dive deep into analysis, we're gonna keep things high level. We first have to answer the question of how management should handle EA's current and future operations. To do this, we need to assess some secondary issues, including some ethical considerations, the issues with cash flow management, some internal company changes that need to take place, particularly with shareholders, and the potential for the RTS acquisition. Our recommendation is to expand EA by stabilizing these costs, aligning these incentives with shareholders, and acquiring RTS at a target of 2.5 million and give back to the community moving into the future. The impacts speak for themselves at a 7% increase in market share and a 19% increase in annualized EBITDA. So before we move forward, let's address the ethical consideration. It's important for you to grow your business, but it's also just as important for you to also grow your community. With this in mind, let's take a look at the ownership structure. It's very obvious, Mr. Kubisek, that you own a majority of the company, but it gets interesting when you overlay the strategy that each shareholder has. Your brother gets isolated here. This polarity has resulted in some you know, conflict and Paul, we, we believe should be bought out to unify a shareholder strategy that promotes growth. This is gonna allow your company to grow and it's also gonna free up funds for Paul to invest in other in, uh, investments, which will actually give him the dividends he's looking for. It's just very important that we're very cognizant of the fact that he's your brother and he wants to sustain this relationship. Now let's take a look at your core competencies. They speak for themselves with your superior service, your certifications, the fact that you release your IP is very unheard of in the industry. And these three things combined result in your strong brand reputation. This strong brand reputation justifies your pricing to consumers. Consumers know that if you're, you're charging something expensive, it's because of the quality behind it. Now, I want to turn your attention to some key industry trends. The one of most interest to us is the risk of the rising interest rates in the industry. You brought to our attention the fact that you're struggling with your cash flow management. This is going to be heightened and worsened if we move into a much more high interest rate environment. And as such, we need to ensure that you act fast to resolve these cash flow issues before anything gets worse. It raises the obvious question, what's causing these issues? And to answer this, we need to look at your customers under two lenses. First, with the small customers, there's delays with suppliers sometimes, or the customers aren't able to receive it. But we see this, these issues as temporary and born out of COVID-19. And furthermore, they don't even contribute noticeably to the large problem in the grand scheme of things. The real problem lays if you turn to your large customers. This is where you have to pay suppliers up front with long collection periods, having that window of time where you're left out to dry. This is a permanent issue that requires action. We found two possible solutions. First, 
you need to turn to your suppliers and try and negotiate for supplier trade credits. Hopefully you'll be able to negotiate something. Um, and alongside this, we also want you to offer customers early payment discounts so that hopefully they get cash in your pocket sooner. We believe that combination of these strategies will result in a net benefit for your cash flow management. Now you also asked us the question of whether or not we should support CAWIC. And of course it goes without saying that it's a worthy cause to fight for gender equality in the workforce. However, your company in particular is a very good fit for this organization because you have the ability to do more than invest just money in this organization. You have the ability to provide your industry insights and connections to enable these women to be able to have more opportunities. And because you can make a bigger impact than others, there's an ethical obligation for you to do so. With that, we now turn to some of the finances. And the first question or concern we will be addressing is how should your trucks be financed? And for this, we have three options. The first is to keep the trucks. And this means that you'll keep them for two years and have a $5,000 salvage value at the end of those two years. However, this is a disadvantage because it misses out on the $30,000 current selling price in the market. And that could be used to fund buying or leasing those trucks. And so the two options are really buying or leasing. They have different cost structures, but taking a present value of both of these, leasing does have a lower present value and lower cost. And so that is the option that we'll be uh, recommending to you. The second financial concern is the exchange rate risk that you have from having international suppliers. And for that, we have two solutions and both are based on speculation of the market. The first is an unfavorable speculation. And for that, we do recommend that you go into a forward contract. For this, you'll be paying a small fee and that will lock in an exchange rate for the future selling price of your deal with your suppliers. And this will help to mitigate that unfavorable change in exchange rate. However, if there is a favorable change in exchange rate, we do recommend that you still take your spot rate practices and really make sure that you're actually doing them. And so for this, you will not enter into any contracts and you will really be able to benefit from the favorable change in the exchange rate. However, just noting that going forward, it is expected that the Canadian dollar will get stronger. And so for right now, leveraging the spot rates is what is best for you, but you can trial um, going forward with some contracts as well for those unfavorable changes and make sure you're doing that at a minority weighting. Raph has already mentioned that cash flows can be a concern for you. And so let's look at a snapshot of monthly cash flows going into 2022. As you can see here, there is a cash deficit in the first three months. And this is mainly due to some large deliveries occurring, but the payments don't occur to you until two months later. And for those deficits, you will have to dip into your line of credit. As you can see, there is a spike in that line of credit, but with some healthy surplus cash that is generated from your other revenue sources and cash flows, you will be able to pay that back very quickly. And that helps to limit your interest rate expense to about 8K from 32K, which was the past year. And the big takeaway here is that you were able to meet your current cash requirements with the existing line of credit. And that is about a $1 million line of credit and you aren't maxing that out. Knowing that you are financially healthy and you do have strong cash flows going into the future, the next question is, should you acquire the Canadian branch of RTS? And to answer this question, we have conducted a discounted cash flow analysis using these following conservative assumptions. Additionally, we have projected free cash flows up until 2026. And the EBIT here does include an adjustment for overhead costs since you did identify that it might have been misallocated and underallocated. So we included an increase of $55,000 in those overhead costs. The, that flows all the way down to free cash flow, which is quite stable and does start increasing towards the end. Using these free cash flows as well as the assumptions, we get a net present value of 2.5 million. We also use the industry EBITDA multiplier of five, and that gives a price of 2.48 million. Both of these are under the $3 million asking price. And so this indicates that the asking price is much too high and there is room to negotiate down to the intrinsic value of 2.5 million. 
Of course, this is our best estimate assumption on the value of RTS. We like to see how sensitive it is to the assumptions that we have, specifically the weighted average cost of capital, a fundamental assumption, and the expense growth rate, which Ralph did mention, inflation can be a concern going forward. The base scenario looks at a 15% weighted average cost of capital and a 1.25% expense growth rate. As you can see from the sensitivity analysis, the most unfavorable results are from higher expense growth rates, specifically about 4%. Now this is quite a spike in the expense growth rates and highly unlikely to increase significantly fast. And so we do believe that our best estimate is accurate and is the true value of RTS. And acquiring this, you'll need to finance this uh, acquisition. And so this can be done through a bank loan of 2.5 million, financed with the following terms. This equates to about a $600,000 annual payment that can be covered from your existing cash flows of EA and proxy operations, as well as the RTS cash flows. And any um, financing needed above that 2.5 million to acquire the company can be taken from the cash flows generated as well. Knowing that it is financially feasible to acquire RTS, let's look at some qualitative reasoning as to why you should acquire it. The first is the customer base is acquired. This aligns with your current customer base and helps you to expand in the industry. Second, looking at the strengthens your service business, which is quite profitable and can help to increase and strengthen your cash flows even more. And lastly, there are synergies associated with this, which will equate to cost savings in the long run. Looking at some cons or concerns, there are some issues surrounding employees, specifically that employees will need to be um, kept for the first year. And uh, if you will not keep the employees, then you will have to pay out a severance package for that year, which can be quite costly. However, it may be beneficial to have all this knowledge of these employees doing the transition of this acquisition. Secondly, looking at the understated costs that are inflating the value. We did address this with the change in our EBIT in the evaluation. So we believe that 2.5 million is the true value of RTS and you will be able to acquire it for a cost around there. And lastly, the unethical kickback structure that RTS currently practices, providing kickbacks for general contractors to do business with them. It is important to note here that the kickback structure, structure can be phased out post acquisition. And this is actually great because you'll be able to control this unethical practice in the industry and encourage more ethical practices in the market going forward. To conclude all of our analysis, we've come up with a recommendation that I'm excited to present to you. And that is to expand EA by stabilizing costs, aligning shareholder incentives, acquiring RTS at a 2.5 million target price and giving back to the community. And this can be done through overhauling company policies, specifically the shareholder policy and the dividend policy, and additionally, the payment structure with suppliers and clients. Secondly, buying out Paul. And this will help to align both of yours and Paul's investing incentives. And also to implement new charity incentives and really giving back to the women in the community and helping to encourage them to be a bigger part of the construction industry. Lastly, this will mainly be financed through acquiring RTS and really in, uh, increasing those cash flows. The financial impacts of our recommendation, you can see here, even in the most bullet bearish scenario, it's about a doubling EBITDA of about 4.5 million. There's also 7% increase in market share and 19% annualized increase in EBITDA overall. And this in total gives you more money to give back to the community and invest in the construction business and truly expand the pie. In order to make this recommendation a reality, we have projected a four-phase, four-year implementation at a total cost of $2.8 million. We will be monitoring each of our four phases under three primary company initiatives. The first of which is to mirror, to mirror some of the internal process changes required. In the first, uh, first week, we want you to hit ground running by holding an immediate shareholder meeting. This is when we will propose the buyout to Paul. It is very important that we convey the right message to him by making it clear that the other shareholders prefer to be moving in a company, company's growth-oriented direction, as well as he should be shown how the proceeds he will gain 
from his buyout can be used in alternative investments, which yield the dividends he's looking for. The second category is stakeholder consideration. And right now it is important to respond to our Ontario customers invoice request. Again, it is very important that we convey the right message to our customer and be transparent about the decision-making process. Citing the reasons shown above will hopefully mitigate any hard feelings they might have about the answer. And finally, we will look to kick off the acquisition process by signing an NDA with RTS and approaching the bank for financing. Moving on to phase two. To kick off internal process changes, we will start negotiating forward for foreign exchange contracts with the bank and send a tentative offer to Paul for his review. We recommend you something in the range of five times EBITDA for his 5% stake, bringing his value to around 600K. In stakeholder consideration, this is where we will begin negotiating with our large customers and suppliers. As shown, we want to negotiate a net 30 trade credit and offer a 2% discount within 15 days and net 45 term for our large suppliers. Between these two initiatives, we are confident we can repair some of the current issues you're suffering with your cash flows. In this stage of acquisition, we want to secure the financing and negotiate a target price of $2.5 million with a resistance point of 2.9 million. With the higher premium being derived from the cost energies and operational efficiencies implemented post acquisition. Next, in phase three, here is where we will transition to the leasing of our drug fleet and sell the old drugs. And finally, finalize the buyout terms with Paul. We will also be grandfathering in the contractual changes to suppliers and customer relations and begin the first stage of establishing a long standing relationship with CAWIC. We think it is a good idea to meet and plan joint initiative and discuss opportunities that you can offer given your company's position in the industry. At this stage in the acquisition, we want the deal to close so, so we can implement an effective transition of business. It is very important that both RTS and taxi shareholders are met at various level of the business to ask for the feedback and how best integrate the business. Moving on to phase four. Here, we will be monitoring the effectiveness and necessity of the contracts for foreign exchange and adjust where necessary. We will also monitor the effectiveness of our changes to supplier and customer contracts and really double down on our relationship with CAWIC to help put into action some of the previously discussed initiatives. Finally, we will have a fully integrated business with R, uh, of RTS with Praxi, having fully realized synergies between the two businesses. Keeping to our promise, we recommend fully removing kickbacks as a business practice at this stage. Any recommendations has risks, and we have identified three primary risks, which can be easily mitigated. The first is loss of customers due to the proposed contractual changes. While, to, uh, while we do prefer to see quality over quantity when it comes to our customer base, we, we would encourage you to scale up your sales and customer outreach team to help get more aggressive and find the right customers. The second is insufficient cash flow. In this scenario, it might be beneficial to scale up the areas of business which provide us with the most predictable cash flows, which is the service line. As well as we can increase our line of credit where it need to be to reflect the true needs of business. Finally, the third main risk will be rejection of offer by RTS. There is a low probability with mid to high impact for, for this risk. While we do recommend negotiating up to your sticking point of 2.9 million and anything in, in excess would not be worth it for the value from the value perspective. So at this point, we'd, we would like to seek another opportunity to diversify your business to ensure we set engineered assemblies on the correct growth path to, uh, path to success. Today, it was important that we answered the question of how management handles EA's current and future operations. We had to take into consideration a number of factors 
uh, including the ethical considerations on the table, the issues you're currently facing with cash flow management, the internal company changes, whether that be from the shareholders, and as well as the obvious potential RTS acquisition. Our recommendation combats all of these issues by allowing you to expand by stabilizing your costs, aligning the shareholder incentives, and acquiring this company, hopefully at that $2.5 million target, and allowing your company to grow to a level where they're able to sustain more and more community engagement. The impacts, seeing that 7% increase in market share, watching that pie grow, as well that 19% increase in annualized EBITDA will of course inevitably lead you to the reality in which you seek, to be able to make a bigger piece of the pie with a bigger pie. With that, we'd like to open the floor to any questions. Yeah, uh, Tay, you could go ahead. Sorry, I should I should know to unmute by now. Um, <laughs> thank you for the presentation, and maybe I maybe I missed it. Uh, have you guys uh, dive into the dividend policy? Was it discussed during the presentation? So I can answer that question. Basically, uh, we looked at the dividend policy. A at this point. Uh, in the implementation, we discussed that we are not going to go ahead with paying dividends in the future. Although we are going to make the, meet the commitments we have made in the past, because the company's future is to grow and to acquire as much as market share. So if they can use the earnings they generate and invest in the future. So in the future, we don't want to pay dividends. That's why we want to buy a call who is more interested in getting dividends. Does that answer your question? Yep, and it was, and can you maybe tell me uh, what slide it was? So it was in the implementation slide and uh, we have it in, in the appendix as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicole, you could go next. Thank you. I'm just wondering if the reputational risk uh, for letting go of the employees when you purchase RTS was discussed. Yes, I can take that question here. Um, so we decided to not recommend uh, getting rid of those employees. It can be beneficial to have all of that knowledge in that first year. And that will be good to identify all the synergies going forward. And so we will not be recommending you get rid of any of those employees and you won't have to pay those severance packages. You'll have to pay the employee's salaries, but we do believe that the larger benefit comes from the synergies identified in the long run from having the knowledge of all those employees in that first year. Just to quickly add on to that as well, part of the implementation was touching on how the employees would be um, really a part of the process of the transition of the business. And so they would be surveyed and they'd be a part of that transition themselves. Perfect, thank you. Um, Randy, you could go ahead. Yes, thank you. My question was somewhat answered by the, by the previous one, but uh, I was wondering if you considered the impacts on employee morale, if uh, some of the proxy employees had to be let go and also on, on the, um, the new employees coming over from uh, RTS, is it? Um, discontinuing the, uh, the kickback program and therefore they might see a negative impact on, on sales or be concerned about that. So what, uh, what actions did you recommend to, to mitigate those potential issues? Of course, at the forefront of every acquisition is how are the people going to react? And so that's why, again, um, really from the get-go, these stakeholders need to be part of the decision-making process. And really, we're going to seek uh, answers from them on how they think the uh, businesses would best integrate within themselves because they're going to be experts in their own fields. Um, but we're not looking to let people off in that first year. Uh, I know that was an option that you brought to us on the table, but we think that we want to make the transition over because we know that our practice employees are very highly skilled. 
Um, we do unfortunately have to take kickbacks off the table. It was even something you brought up to us. It's not something that we want to um, have as our current business operations. And there's always going to be resistance to change. But if we want to move in an ethical direction, we have to fight through that. Thank you. Um, Tracy, you could go ahead. No, actually, you're just muted. Sorry about that. Um, with the recommendation to go ahead with forward contracts to hedge some of the foreign exchange risk, was there discussion on a foreign exchange policy that might decide how much of the business you want hedged, how much might be on spot versus forward, and maybe some guidelines around tenor? Yes. Uh, um... Raf, if you can go to the developing of FX strategy. So we kind of develop, um, asked the CEO, we want the CFO to develop a FX strategy by mirroring the foreign exchange risk faced by the company, deciding on the risk tolerance and which exposures to hedge. So it might be a speculative bet to enter into some spot changes as well as to enter into some uh, futures agreement, uh, forward, sorry, foreign exchange forwards agreement because we don't know how it will fit your business. So we recommended only hedging 15% of your exposure using the uh, future, oh, sorry, the forward forward FX agreements and measure the benefit of that from your, uh, to your business and make changes going forward because the interest rates are supposed to rise in future. So you might benefit more from the spot rates and less from the forward agreement. So we wanted to give you only a 15% exposure, but this can be changed in the future depending upon the benefit you have gained from that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just have the last question from Randy. Yes, my question was, uh, was there any discussion of the request from the larger client to shift invoices from, I believe it was Ontario to Alberta? Yes, absolutely. And this was touched on in the uh, implementation. Uh, unfortunately, we were going to have to reject that um, offer from that client. And I can really bring it back to that direct slide. Um, and these are the reasons that we set out to him. Uh, there is additional management costs that would have to take place to fulfill that. Uh, the ethical concern with the loss to the sales team on the commissions, um, as well as the bad precedent that's being set amongst other customers, these are all huge, huge costs to us. Um, and we have no problem with expressing the truth to him about the, the reality. And I think that they'll be pretty uh, understanding of that. But if there was any other option they wanted to discuss and pursue, we'd be all ears. But unfortunately, we had to reject. Yeah, sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Okay, delegates. Um, thank you for your presentation today.